Dr. Alexander has given us a beautiful and inspiring meditation on the life of Dr. King, and she unpacks the nature of his dream. Um, for me, the most compelling part of her lecture concerns her vision of what the dream might look like as it was actualized in contemporary time. It's a, it's a really hopeful and inclusive future. Um, she reads a letter written in 2013 about what Dr. King's life and dream would look like today in 2018. She imagines that racism and poverty have come to a permanent end, that there was a universal access to a robust and creative healthcare system that was at work curing intractable diseases. And she speaks also of an end to violence in the streets. I would say that her vision is true to King's own vision, the one that he ceaselessly and continuously and prophetically agitated, especially in these last three years of his life. Uh, the way that he spoke out so compellingly against the triple threat in global affairs, racism, poverty, and war. He wanted to create global coalitions to end racism and colonialism. He wanted to cease U.S. involvement in Vietnam, something that cost him dearly in terms of friends and connections, relationships with the, with the president at the time, uh, completely changed his life and ministry. And he wanted to marshal the nation to a multi-ethnic coalition against poverty, he wanted to see a redeployment of these astronomical national investments into the material and human capital of war. Wanted to see all of that redeployed in the nation for an effective war on poverty. But the climax of Dr. Alexander's vision celebrated it. This was really, this just captured my imagination. She celebrated the day when the U.S. was led by a black president, a female vice president, a Native American speaker of the House, a Latino chief justice of the Supreme Court, and an Asian American majority speaker of the Senate. This vision, dear as it is to me, to Dr. Alexander, as true as it is to King's own vision, this is a vision that is creating a great backlash among white America today. And this is a place where I hope we can have some conversation. Now, this kind of a backlash was every bit as relevant and powerful in King's own day as it is in ours. Dr. King writes about an, the antagonistic duel and warring impulses in the soul of the United States. He tells how we have, on the one hand, a deep commitment to equality and justice, but we have an equally powerful, sometimes even more powerful, aversion to the democratic ideal, one that clings to a white supremacist status quo which causes a nation to take a step backward simultaneously with every step forward on the question of racial justice. That's, that's a quote. He speaks of vacillations and rationalizations and the nation's, quote, congenital deformity regarding the deep roots of racism in our national psyche. In the words of Dr. King, quote, these concepts of racism and the schizophrenic duality of conduct remain deeply rooted in American thought today. This tendency of the nation to take one step forward on a question of racial justice and then to take a step backward is still the pattern. Just as an ambivalent nation freed the slaves a century ago with no plan or program to make their freedom meaningful, the still ambivalent nation in 1954 declared school segregation unconstitutional with no plan or program to make the integration real. Just as Congress passed a civil rights bill in 1868 and refused to enforce it, 
The Congress passed the Civil Rights Bill in 1964, and to this day has failed to enforce it in all its dimensions. Just as the 15th Amendment in 1870 proclaimed Negro suffrage, only to permit its de facto withdrawal in half the nation. So also in 1965, the voting rights law was passed and then permitted to languish with only fractional and half-hearted implementation, end quote. In other words, these, <laughs> these words resonate as much today as they did when he wrote them in 1967. Political events in these opening years of the 21st century are quite possibly new inflection points across the broad sweep of race relations in the United States. Advances in civil rights in this country are often met with a white backlash. After King and the passage of the Voting Rights Act, we've seen a decades-long persistence of the so-called Southern strategy this first introduced coded racist appeals in political debate. In other words, this was the rise of dog whistle racism. This transformed the South from a rock solid Democratic stronghold to an equally dependent Republican bastion. I am convinced that the current moment of demographic change, a moment that is manifest concretely in the election of the first African-American president in 2008 and again in 2012, it represents a similar moment of rising white fear and backlash against what is perceived as an imminent loss of white social dominance. Recent psychological studies have demonstrated a link among whites between their responses to demographic change and more negative perceptions of all people of color. The same research team found a correlation between responses to demographic change and white political alignment with the Republican Party. Isn't that interesting? In other words, the open bigotry that we see from the highest office in the land is not so much a disease that is, that is all about resurrecting xenophobia's dark and bitter path. Rather, it's a symptom of the disease pathology of racism. It's congruent with the ebb and flow of civil rights advances and reactive bias retreat. Both of these functioning and on the backs of heavy evangelical support. This is not to label all evangelicals so implicated as bigots and racists, I, I, I often say that, but it is to worry aloud <laughs> about how fear of living in a radically multi-ethnic country is strong enough to drive members of the body of Christ to embrace the profoundly unchristian behaviors and profoundly unchristian actors. It is to worry that racism is tightening its grip on the evangelical psyche, resulting in idolatry of the first order. Speaking of the overwhelming evangelical support for accused pedophile and confirmed racist, Roy Moore, who is a, a close associate of, of the president, the lead editor of Christianity Today, said that the biggest loser in the Alabama Senate election is not Republicans or Democrats, but Christian witness. <clears throat> and I think that this is equally true of the initial and continued support for Trump among evangelicals. In 1967, King writes, quote, over the last five years, many religious bodies, Catholic, Protestant, and Jewish, have been on the vanguard of the civil rights struggle and have sought desperately to make the ethical insights of our Judeo-Christian heritage relevant to the question of race. But the church as a whole has been all too negligent on the question of civil rights. It has too often blessed a status quo that needed to be blasted 
and reassured a social order that needed to be reformed. So the church must acknowledge its guilt, its weak and vacillating witness, its all too frequent failure to obey the call to servanthood. Today, the judgment of God is upon the church for its failure to be true to its mission. If the church does not recapture its prophetic zeal, it will become an irrelevant social club without moral or spiritual authority, end quote. In the wake of the president's latest racist comments where he likened African nations to human excrement and disparaged Haitian refugees, thereby <laughs> bringing all peoples of black descent in the African diaspora. I, I am beginning to revisit my assessment about the culpability of Trump supporters, and especially those among them who profess to worship Christ. It's, it's not so much that I am reacting to this latest news. Uh, frankly, in my judgment, <laughs> there was enough evidence to convict him of racism on the day he announced his candidacy by calling Mexicans rapists. So I, I wasn't surprised about this latest contretemps. Um, but what happened to me was not so much just reaction to this latest thing, but it was really, it was just a, a particular moment in my life. I was at the intersection of, of responding to Dr. Alexander's lecture, of uh, doing teaching preps for my class that I'm teaching, two classes I'm teaching this term, one on race and one on the book of Revelation. So as I was preparing for my race class, I was uh, preparing for the session where I introduced a, a more technical precision to terms used in racial and ethnic studies. Um, so, for instance, racist is not a racial epithet, um, as, as many whites seem to feel, where they really re at response to it as if they're being called evil. I instead, racist is a technical term for anyone who perpetuates hierarchical relationships with whites on top and people of color on the bottom. That's where racist is. I was thinking about him 20, how in 2016, um, in January, when I teach this class all the time in, in the winter, so in, it's always near the beginning. So in January, I remember in 2016, I was looking for an illustration for the concept of active racist. That's a person who uses demeaning language and, and visibly and horribly discriminating policies for people of color. <laughs> so I've been teaching this class for a while um, and I'm getting older, right? So it used to be my example was always Archie Bunker, <laughs> which dates me, right? Uh, but my students are younger and younger these days. And I was really groping for, who, okay, who is a public person who embodies this act of racism? They were like, Dr. Seacrest, Trump. But for this 2018 class, just a, a few days ago, I was uh, reviewing Beverly Daniel Tatum's uh, uh, updated, her revised book, it's amazing. I highly recommend it to anyone who is wanting to come up to speed in these issues. And she introduces in her revised edition a new metaphor to elaborate on the difference between active racism, passive racism, and anti-racism. For her, racism is like a moving sidewalk, which moves faster than the average speed of those who aren't on the moving sidewalk. In this case, or in this case, those who don't have access to the moving sidewalk. So if, if you actively walk while on a moving sidewalk, you are illustrating active racism. You're moving even faster than ordinary sort of institutional racism. But if you stand still on the moving sidewalk, you're still moving faster than those not on it. Even if you were born on that moving sidewalk, even if you think it's normal to be on the moving sidewalk, that's passive racism. It's only if you're turning around and actively moving in the opposite direction that you are resisting racism and that you are becoming an anti-racist. 
so as I was preparing this, I was revisiting the, the habitual ways I had begun to talk about Trump supporters. I used to say, not all people who supported Trump are racist. But they did turn the country over to one. That, that's how I used to talk about it. But in light of this difference between active racism and passive racism, it's really better to say that they are unconscious or at least passive racist, yeah? So over the last couple of days, as the nation has been processing this last comment about African nations and Haitian refugees, I have heard more than one uh, journalist ask the question, is he a racist? And, and I've heard more than one politician respond, well, we can't tell when it's, it, what's in his heart. I have so many responses to that, it's hard to know what it's all right. Like, like, so if he is not a racist, then the word, the phrase active racism has no meaning. That's the first thing to say. Um, and it's also, I also want to challenge this idea that we can't know what it's, what's in his heart. Um, first, psychological science is trying to help us with this. I begin my classes by having students take the implicit association test because it tries to get at those unconscious, subconscious biases that really power our decisions, our actions. But, but even if you don't want to trust that, from a biblical confess perspective, we confess that there is indeed a way to tell what's in someone's heart. Matthew 15, 18 and 19 says, the words you speak come from the heart. That's what defiles you. For from the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, all sexual immorality, theft, lying, and slander. Generations from now, your children and your grandchildren will want to hear stories about what you did in this great civil rights moment. When voting rights were being rolled back, when refugees were being expelled, when the parents and spouses of American citizens are being jailed at the border in concentration camps, separated from their partners and children, where were you? Did you stand with the marginalized? Did you visit them in prison, feed them clothing, tend to their wounds? Just minutes ago, I read Dr. King's 1967 words about the church, that they were failing their crisis moment. But in God's mercy and kindness, we have a new opportunity to get it right. And then as I was teaching my revelation class, Jesus stands in the midst of the churches, all seeing, all knowing, watching everything we do measuring our hearts by our words and our deeds. In Revelation, he warns the church in Sardis, I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are in fact dead. Wake up and strengthen whatever you have left, teetering on the brink of death. For I found that your works are far from complete in the eyes of my God. So remember what you have received and heard. Hold on to it and change your hearts and lives. If you don't wake up, I will come like a thief and you won't know what time I will come among you. But to those others, those who couldn't read the, ta the times and who were found to be tepid and lukewarm, with the same temperature as the surrounding society. Jesus says to the church in Laodicea, I know your works. Because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I am about to vomit you from my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, got my tax cut, and I need nothing. You don't realize that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I reprove and discipline those whom I love. Be earnest, therefore, and repent. 
Let everyone with an ear hear what the Spirit says to the churches.